Just to start, um, over the past 30 years of coming to Hungary, um, I met Elamir on many, many occasions, both in Budapest and here in Kuseg. Not only was I struck by his erudition, but I also recognized that it was combined with a gentle but profound insightfulness that always brought Samuel Beckett and Zen Buddhism to mind. Um, in many ways, when, when Elamir made presentations, there were so many questions that I couldn't help but think about, you know, a, a koan, a Zen koan, in which, you know, what, what is the sound of one hand clapping, right? You know, these kinds of questions that were meant to stimulate the mind and to get you out of your normal way of thinking. Um, but he also shared some sensibility with, with Samuel Beckett, it seems to me. Um, Beckett uh, was written to by a young Irish writer shortly after, a fellow named Aidan Higgins, shortly after uh, Waiting for Godot was produced in, uh, in Paris in the late 1950s. And Higgins wrote him by way of you know, asking for some counsel. He was a young writer and he wanted to know what Beckett thought. Everybody said, Beckett won't write you back. But Beckett did write him back. Four words by way of counsel. Those four words were, despair young and never look back, right? It's exactly that kind of mix of pessimism and optimism. And in some ways, um, you would think that actually Beckett gave the same kind of advice to Elamir, um, to spare Young. And Beckett, if you, if you stop and look at what happened in Elamir's life, he had a very happy childhood. He's, he writes about this, very happy childhood. And then World War II came. Um, the despair arrived. He was 16 years old. He, he said, our entire family was dragged into the depths. And from that moment on, I considered the world an alien world. He would admit even in 2013 that he still felt this way. Quote, not only personally, but I believe the whole of mankind lives in a very cold, alienated world in which it is very hard to live as a human being. One result was he was always interested in the great questions of human existence. Um, in spite of this despair, and again here, I think Beckett is relevant. Um, in the final novel of his trilogy, the novel is called The Unnameable, for those of you who don't know it. The last few lines of the character go like this. It will be I. You must go on. I can't go on. You must go on. I'll go on. You must say words as long as there are any. Elamir did go on, and he also said words despite their increasing disappearance in slogans and advertising. This was because, as he said, quote, it is obvious that we need to fight for everything, and especially against human suffering. As many people here will know, I think, Elamir himself suffered significantly in the middle years of his life, I have little doubt that he often said the equivalent of, I'll go on. Um, he thought of himself after World War II as an, and again, to quote from him, an outsider, and found that to be considered as such was a big shock. But then, with the communist era, he was, quote, considerably, completely excluded as a class enemy. As I think everybody knows, he went to prison in the 1950s. And he said, prison was good, both personally and professionally. It was a useful challenge to see if you are able to hang on, to go on. When they took me in, he said, early in the morning, I was shaking with fear. I was wondering what was about to happen. The rumors were terrifying. Although we were hiding, they caught us. They didn't beat us. It was just the psychological torture that went on for three or four months. It was not only you being tortured, it was watching how your cellmates were treated. That was terrible. Sometimes their fear of death was worse than your own. They were facing horrible sentences. The prison was good for seeing what you are able to bear. I mean to, 
I mean, to see if you were able to act like you write, like a man should act. I can't claim that. If I had been physically tortured, I would have been able to keep it together. But I can tell you one thing. I was able to bear a wide range of psychological torture. It is useful to try it, to challenge yourself that you are not that you are able not just to speak, but to stand up for your thoughts. Finally, in this regard, uh, and you know, I, I tentatively titled this presentation The Existential Crisis of the Self because it's something I've been concerned about for a long time. You know, the fact that the old narratives don't work very well anymore and that there's a real crisis of meaning underlying contemporary existence. Uh, in a conference chaired by Timothy Garton Ash in the late 90s, he made similar arguments about the, quote, new consumer civilization because, in his words, it was unable to offer answers to the essential questions of human life. In the absence of such answers, a trivial consumer culture, he said, meaning advertising, offers surrogate, shallow alternatives, which, according to Elamir, people will, quote, buy as long as no others are offered by churches, the state, or other institutions. The most compelling commentary that he made about our existential crisis was an essay that he wrote um, shortly after the attacks of September 11th in the United States. He was asked to contribute an essay by the Social Science Research Council in New York. And I want to quote from one, one portion of that because I think it's profound, but I also think that in some ways um, it's a bit incorrect. Um, it starts out with emphasis, death, triumphant. With a certain degree of exaggeration, this, these are Elamir's words, with a certain degree of exaggeration, one could say that together with the towers, the buildings, the illusion of immortality collapsed as well on September 11th. We, people living in our contemporary consumer civilization, believe and want to believe so strongly in the power of the human being to solve the problems of life that we have almost come to believe that even the ultimate problem of human existence, mortality, can be solved. Or at least it can and should be eliminated from human consciousness. And again, his words, and on September 11th, we were suddenly and rudely confronted with the fragility of human life, and we could not avert our eyes from the terrible sight. We could not ignore anymore the unacceptable fact of death. Even if only temporarily, death has moved into our hearts. Several scholars um, have argued that the denial of death is one of the, most is one of the main characteristics of citizens of contemporary Western civilization, the civilization of consumption. As many of you know, Elamir was profoundly influenced by Ernest Becker, who wrote a book by that title, The Denial of Death. Um, and Becker argued that much more was at stake in the ordeal of mankind than shelter and safety. The goal was to achieve immortality, or at least to conquer the fear of death. Becker argued that the fear of death is the main motive force in human life. The idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainspring of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of man. In contrast, Hankish noted that Becker emphasized the primary importance of society and civilization. He argued, the main function and raison d'etre of society is nothing else than to provide its members with meaningful roles that help them ignore the emptiness of being and the futility of their lives. But Hankish was wrong in pointing to September 11th. I think he'd become a bit of a New Yorker. In reality, it was in August 1945, with the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that we were suddenly and rudely confronted with the fragility of human life, and that death 
moved into our hearts. In this sense, the existential crisis is concrete, not abstract or spiritual. Um, some years ago, when I was at an institute in California, we had a meeting with William Perry. Some of you may have seen his recent book. Um, Perry was number three at the Pentagon in the Carter administration in the late 1970s. He was the technical expert, right? He was the engineer. He got a call in the middle of the night from the general under Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, which is where the command center is for nuclear weapons. He looked, um, the, the general said to him, Mr. Perry, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm calling you instead of the president because I think there's a technical problem um, and our computer screens shouldn't be showing several hundred Soviet missiles coming in on the United States. They solved the problem. It was somebody had put a t training tape into the computers. Now imagine, imagine that there was a different general under Cheyenne Mountain today and that that general called Donald Trump. If you don't have an existential crisis over that, you should have. The same thing happened, of course, on the Soviet side, right? Stanislav Petrov, the man who saved the world under, during the Reagan administration, faced the same kind of problem. And he decided that the geopolitical situation did not merit showing NATO missiles coming in on the Soviet Union. He took a risk. The submarine in this photo the USS Kentucky is part of a class of submarines, seven to 10 of which are out in sea right now. Right? Um, it's ready for a message from the President of the United States, should it be needed. It has 200 nuclear weapons on it. Each one has a destructive power 30 times that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, in addition to the bombs on the Kentucky and other submarines like it, the United States has another 3,000 nuclear weapons on ready alert, as do the Russians. This means, essentially, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm expecting to have a drink tonight. Um, this means we'd all be dead in an hour, essentially. Right? The decision-making time that the President of the United States has is a little over five minutes. Just, what's that? I want to end this discussion by um, uh, reading something to you from uh, Jonathan Schell's book, The Fate of the Earth, which transformed many people's minds about what was going on with nuclear weapons. Here's Schell. Only life itself, which nuclear weapons threaten to swallow up, can give the measure of their significance. Yet in spite of the immeasurable importance of nuclear weapons, the world has declined, and this is about us. The world has declined on the whole to think about them very much. We have thus far failed to fashion or to discover within ourselves an emotional or intellectual or political response to them. But this peculiar failure of response in which hundreds of millions of people acknowledge the presence of an immediate unremitting threat to their existence and to the existence of the world they live in, but do nothing about it, a failure in which both self-interest and fellow feelings seem to have died, has itself been such a striking phenomenon that it has to be regarded as extremely important. And finally, the Hiroshima people's experience, accordingly, is of much more than historical interest. It is a picture of what our whole world is always poised to become a backdrop of scarcely imaginable horror lying just below the surface of our normal life and capable of breaking through into that normal life at any second. Whether we choose to think about it or not, it is an omnipresent, inescapable truth about our lives today that, every, that at every single moment, each one of us may suddenly become the deranged mother looking for her, and this is the experience 
Shell is talking about from Hiroshima. The deranged mother looking for her burned child, the professor with a ball of rice in his hand whose wife has just died in the fires, Mr. Fukai running back into the firestorm, the naked man standing on the blasted plain that was his city, holding his eyeball in his hand, or more likely, one of millions of corpses. For whatever our modest hopes as human beings may be, every one of them can be nullified by a nuclear holocaust. So there's a moral challenge to all of us. I would challenge all of you, you know, if you can bear it, read about the victims of Hiroshima. Put it in your mind. It's not easy, but do it. For our own survival, for the survival of our children, grandchildren, and friends and lovers. And let us continue Elamir's work and confront the fragility of human life and move death from our hearts and replace it with that which makes us human, a politics informed by love. Thanks very much.